tonight and, and help us. I mean, help us. Because we need him, his help. I need his help today. And uh, for the last two or three days, and I'm just going, you know, I don't have a thing to hide. Now, if, our, if our lives are open book, then we don't need to be covering things up under the rug. But uh, the last two or three days, I have just been just easily irritated. It just, you might say, just irritable. And uh, I, I was praying. We had a prayer meeting out here this morning. And the Lord came by and helped us to pray. And uh, I appreciate every time the Lord touches me, don't you? Amen. When he touches you, you appreciate that. And, uh, and, and he did today. And yet, yet, there's just so many things going on around us and so much pressure. Uh -huh. that if we're not careful, we'll just allow those things just right. creep in and start just uh, crowding out the face of God that belongs to us as his children. And we don't need to be letting him do that. I sure don't. Amen. But 1 Kings chapter 18, one of the, just a very, very familiar passage of scripture in the Old Testament. 1 Kings 18 and 20, if the Lord will help us here in just a few minutes. Amen. 1 Kings 18 and 20. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together into Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, but if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah to the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them give unto us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. For I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. And call ye upon the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered, said, It's well spoken. And Elijah said unto the people, unto the prophets of Baal, Choose ye one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first. For ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given to them, and dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking or he is pursuing, or he is on a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with their not with knives and lances till blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, and there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that were guarded. And Elijah said unto them, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the sons of Jacob, of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, and unto and to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and he cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice 
twice and on the wood. And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. They did it the third time. And the water ran about the altar and filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day Thou art the God of Israel, in Israel, that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when, the pe all, and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Thank you for standing. That's a way more than I usually read. And I tell you, I really didn't intend to read that much. But sometimes things happen for a reason. And I'll just take it that way. Because I intended to pick up the narrative after it came Elijah's turn to pray. But God has chosen fire as a symbol of the Holy Ghost uh -huh. more times than one. And so to ask God for revival is just like praying fire down from heaven. Come on. Because you re realize that's exactly what happened. There was a revival among those people at that time right. to understand that there was only one God and that it was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and not Baal or any other idol that could be offered any sacrifice to, but it was only God. And we know the story by heart. Amen. Elijah had prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years because God told him to. And it didn't rain. Now he was challenging the prophets of Baal to call fire down from heaven and consume an offering. Now Ahab blamed Elijah for that drought. But Abraham, Ahab was soon to find out just who was to blame. Amen. Because James 5 and 17 said that Elijah prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And so he got the blame. Everybody knew Elijah was praying that way because God told him to. Right, right. Amen. Don't you know that the people of God usually gets the blame when something don't go to suit everybody? Yeah. Come on. Amen. Hallelujah. Right. But the drought was to come to prepare the people to repent of their sins. Amen. They first had to realize the need before their conscience could be awakened. Amen. Amen. I'll say it time and time again. It don't do much good to preach on sin if the Holy Ghost is not convicting of sin. Amen. Hallelujah. We've got to have the Holy Ghost in our midst to convict people of sin. And now I'm going a little bit off of my message here. But I, I, I recall something that I heard Brother Rich, Don Rich, say numerous times in different times that he preached that whenever he was down in Panama among the, the Indian tribe, and I cannot pronounce it, uh, uh, and not too many people, white people, had ever been there before him. And while he was there, and he said that those women came to church that night after those men. He went down there with several other missionaries and they set up to have church and those women came to church <clears throat> the first night and they was naked from their waist up because that's the way they were accustomed to dressing. Amen. It said nobody said one word to them over the way they were dressed. Come on. Not one word. Well, the second night, because it was embarrassing to some of the women folk that went with them, that they gave them underclothes and stuff and to, with the other clothes that they gave them. But the only thing they done was just prayed it around in their underclothes. <laughs> and 
And so they were just bragging on each other, the women were now, that looked on them. And we would just think it would be so obscene. But they didn't because, again, they were accustomed to dress in that way. Come on. He said, but about the third night or so, finally God began to move and conviction fell in the place uh -huh. while the preaching was going on. Amen. The Holy Ghost began to move. Amen. And when it happened that way, they began to try to cover themselves up because they realized in the presence of God yes. that they were naked and they had never been there before. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. So say, things happen sometimes that God prepares us, right. amen, to see a need naturally before we can ever see the need spiritually. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, Elijah asked the people, how long would they halt between two opinions? Here was Baal, and then here was God. There was no middle ground. I still don't believe there's any middle ground. Are you helping me preach? Amen. Hallelujah. There was no middle ground for Herod. When John the Baptist came through preaching, Herod liked to hear that preaching. Yes, he did. He enjoyed listening to John preach. Uh -huh. He enjoyed listening to the anointing of the Holy Ghost that fell upon John. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you helping me? Amen. And he enjoyed that till one day John called Herod's hand. Amen. For because Herod had taken his brother Philip's wife for his own. Amen. And John called his hand and told him, and, and I'm just paraphrasing this, the Bible don't give us detail by detail. I can just about imagine uh, 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 John telling him, Herod, I know you like what you're hearing. I know you like what you're seeing. But the thing about you, Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Amen. Hey, Amen. Herod didn't like that. Amen. But there was no middle ground for him. Hey, Amen. He was either please his wife, hey, Amen, or have John beheaded. Uh -huh. Are you helping me here? Yeah. Hey, Amen. I'm here to tell us tonight, we already know these things. There used to be, I remember a time when there was kind of a middle in the politics. But there's no longer a middle in the politics. Yeah. You're either going to have to be the right on the right side or on the left side. Amen. Are you helping me here? But when it comes to God, we're going to either have to get right or either get left. Amen. Are you helping me preach? Amen. Amen. The Bible said that, that Elijah repaired the broken altar. Amen. Hallelujah. And I know I'm preaching things that we all have heard before. And I don't want you to get weird with me tonight. Because I really felt like God dealt with my heart to preach like this tonight. I realized that we don't have the Sunday morning crowd here. Right. We've just got the Pine Grove crowd that comes on Wednesday night generally. One, with, one visitor, we might say, among us here tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. But that altar is where we fellowship with God in prayer. Right. Amen. And if the enemy can, he'll hinder our praying. Just like Brother Horn said earlier that he likes to, the enemy likes to hinder his singing. Yes. Amen. I remember just a few months, seemed like just a few months ago now, that I would call, try to call him and talk with him with that set of hearing aids that I had then and the way his voice was. We just couldn't hardly communicate at all over the phone because I couldn't hear what he was saying to me. And then with the COVID crisis going, uh -huh. amen, and them afraid of the condition that he was in, he would get sick with that. And so I would just cut off communication completely for a while until God came on the scene. Yeah. Amen. And God touched him. Right. And God raised him up. And since he he began he been able to preach, teach, and sing whatever God lays on his heart. Right. Hallelujah! But we're gonna have to have fellowship with God in prayer. 
And at the end of the he'll hinder that praying. 1963, the liberal Supreme Court ruled out prayer in our classrooms. I remember going to school and the teachers starting each day with prayer. Most of you do, if you're older. And then I remember when the Supreme Court ruled against it. And I remember some of those old teachers that we had defied that and prayed anyway. Can't you imagine what kind of a condition the schools would be in today if they were allowed to pray again? We might say, well, maybe it would be better. But look at the spiritual condition of a group of teachers now that have been raised up under no prayer in the school, no prayer in the home. Amen. And all of a sudden now we say, you know, the, the Supreme Court could reverse that ruling just like they did on abortion. They could reverse that ruling and say it's all right to pray. But how are you going to deal with it, brothers and sisters, if you've got, uh, uh, say, 75% of the classroom come from a, a, a Christian background, and yet you've got a Muslim teacher teaching them? Wow. Amen. It's going to have total chaos. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. So the world that we're living in is total chaos, if you will. But God still reigns supreme in control, as Brother Horn preached last Wednesday night. Amen. He's still God supreme. Hallelujah. God, I'm about to feel the presence of the Lord. Amen. And so when we're praying at home, and we're praying for our children at home, we're praying for our grandchildren at home, amen, God's going to go with them and shield them. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. I really believe he's going to keep his hand on them. Right. Amen. The church needs money. Sure we do to survive, to pay the bills. Amen. But giving money is no substitute for prayer. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'm going to hurry real quick. Talking about prayer, Elijah took 12 stones, one for every tribe of Israel. Amen. Elijah reminded them of who they were. Those 12 stones reminded them of who they were. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. And here they were. Northern Israel was where Elijah was doing the most part of his ministry anyway. Yeah. And ever since Jeroboam, they had been worshiping a golden calf. Yeah. Amen. And every king that followed him followed after the sins of Jeroboam. Yeah. But Elijah was reminding them of who they were. Yeah. And each time God made a covenant with them, I'm the God of Abraham, I'm the God of Isaac, yeah. I'm the God of Jacob, or Israel. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. They had a prophetic destiny to feel, yeah. just like you have a prophetic destiny to feel. Amen. Hallelujah. We as a blood-bought people of God have our destiny, destiny to fulfill. And so we're to prepare our altars. Amen. Now Elijah put the wood in order. I'm going to tell you, folks, we've got to get our wood in order. Amen. Not only did he have the stones in proper order, he laid the wood out in order. Amen. And you notice at the beginning of a reading, he had two bullocks. The ones that they cut up to offer to an idol, Elijah didn't use that. He didn't even use their altar. Amen. He made his own altar. Praise God. He wasn't going to offer anything that was offered up to idols. Amen. Do you remember reading in 1 Corinthians? Amen. Some of the early church wouldn't even eat anything that had been offered unto an idol. Hallelujah. Amen. Their conscience just wouldn't let them do it. Amen. But I'm here to tell us today, we need not only get our wood in order, amen, we get our altar in order, because today's sanctification produces tomorrow's miracles. Hallelujah. Would you help me preach? I said today's sanctification is what we're going to have to have to produce the miracles of tomorrow. And I was hesitant of saying it that way. But 
because it appears as long as we can push it to tomorrow, we're never going to have a today. Come on. Come on. God will never move from me like he did Elijah. That's an Old Testament prophecy anyway. But what about the New Testament? God will never move me like he did Apostle Paul. But Peter said the Holy Ghost is for you Amen. and your children. Amen. And then the, those that are far, them that are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. And when we read the book of Acts, and it said that the, when the, you receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and I, I feel like when I'm preaching this, anytime I read the book of Acts, Brother Bill, I read myself under conviction. Amen. 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 I do every time I read it. But when we read it and we see the power that's not present, oh, I feel good when I pray, don't you? I thank God when I speak in other tongues when I pray, don't you? Amen. But the same God that helps us to feel good when we pray and speaks us in other tongues when we pray is the same God that anoints us to, to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Elijah filled the altar with water. When he did that, he made it impossible for anybody but God to consume that sacrifice. Amen. And I'm telling you, when you read this book and you read how it's written, what it says to us, amen, the miracles that come from God are impossible for any type of imposter Amen. to imitate it. Amen. Oh, they can imitate the speaking in tongues. They can carry on until it looks like that it's the biggest move of God you've ever seen in your life. Amen. I realize this is recorded, being videoed tonight, and will probably, probably be posted. Amen. But not too awful long ago, I went to a revival. I was invited to come. And I went. I wasn't expecting to preach. Matter of fact, I was more expecting them to hardly even speak to me. But they come by and laid his hand on me. And the preacher did and said, do you have anything? And so I got up and I preached. And two people, one of them came to the altar and said she got saved. I'll be honest with you, the other one said she got saved. She just didn't want anybody touching her and wanted anybody to leave her alone. Amen, because she had never been around anything where people were falling in the floor and carrying on the way they were doing. And I had no problem with that when the Spirit would slay somebody. Amen, but I'm telling you, I've seen a whole lot of move of the flesh going on that night. And I've seen a whole lot of emotionalism that people call revival today. Amen. And I'm telling you, revival is what happens when God responds with fire. Matter of fact, he asked me to come back the next night. And the Lord showed me in a dream not to go. And I went anyway and it turned right around to be in absolute chaos. Amen. Are you helping me preach? Amen. Because people are not going to have sound doctrine. And I didn't preach anything to upset anybody's apple cart other than the fact that they were up there. Kept on, kept on, kept on, kept on, kept on. Amen. Don't know why churches won't come together. Don't know why churches won't come together. I'm going to tell you something. It's not the will of God for everybody to come together. Amen. Now that might sound a little strange to you. But there's some things that I just cannot come under. Can you? I cannot come under some things. And so then you've got the worldly crowd. They're not going to come under everything. Amen. When I let them know that, some of them got up and left. Amen. But they was in a huff. How are you helping me preach here in just a few minutes? Amen. Oh, glory to God. I'm telling you that when God, revival causes by God, that's caused by God, he's going to respond Amen. with fire. Amen. Amen. And closing this real quickly here tonight, we've got to leave the middle ground and get where we belong with God. Amen. 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 
Hallelujah. Amen. We got to get our altars repaired. Lord, then we got to turn away from sin. Amen. Now, I've been very, very, very lenient as far as a pastor can be concerned over the people coming in that haven't never heard this before. Even if they have heard it, they're not quite sure yet they want to grab hold of it because they haven't let go of the world yet. Amen. And so I have a good understanding enough to know that until a move of God takes place before their eyes, they're not going to grab hold of this at all. And so preaching on what they're doing, we're wasting our time. Amen. But I'm telling you, getting a hold of God and getting the fire falling on us. Amen. That we're not wasting our time. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. So we get that altar repaired. Then we turn away from our sins because we've got in the presence of God. I'm telling you, every time that happens, God will send the fire. Amen. He's always responding with the fire. Hallelujah. When that happens, his blessings will be provided every time. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. But I'm kind of re reminded right what I'm preaching tonight that one preacher said to me, he said, the only thing that edifies me is holiness preaching. Amen. Hey, don't you listen to what I'm talking about real closely here. Amen. When he's talking about holiness preaching, he was simply talking about the outward appearance alone. He said, I would shout glory and I would shout amen if the devil preached holiness. Amen. Let me tell you something. We've got a few devils that's preaching holiness just for the outward appearance alone. But the inside is not right with God. Amen. Are you helping me here a few minutes? Amen. Oh, glory. When that inside gets right with God, something's going to take place in somebody's life. Woo, glory. God's going to send his presence. I feel his presence right here tonight. But I'm talking about answering with fire. Here, brothers, on Sunday morning, when we're in dire need of it on Sunday morning. Oh, glory to God. I'm not scolding us here tonight. For ever don't think I'm scolding us. Amen. But I pray to your sister Kathy, and here this morning, sister Kathy, and I, I'm talking to the Lord. Lord, you see these ruts that we find ourselves falling in. It looks like that just on Sunday morning, we've got this mentality that we got 45 minutes Sunday school, and then we're going to break it real quick. And then we're going to go in church service, and we're going to walk through the same formal service week after week after week. Let me tell you something. Time's too short to fall into a form. Amen. And miss the will of God. Amen. Are you helping me preach? Oh, glory to God. Amen. Too short for us to miss the will of God. And we're doing it. Amen. Oh, God, would you help me here? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, God's got a way of grabbing a hold of us and getting our attention. What kind of a service would we have tonight? Yeah, I'm closing, so I am going to stop ready for God's sake. What kind of service would we have here tonight if we had taken time and been real honest with the rest of the congregation what we have done in the last two weeks to allow the enemy to rob us of that intimate prayer time? Come on. What kind of service would we've had? Some of us here tonight would have been able to stood up and told us, I've not been robbed. No. I prayed, I've sought God. But some of us could stand up here tonight and honestly say, I've allowed the enemy here, and I've allowed the enemy there, and I've allowed the enemy here. And even when we took the time, we never got the door shut. Right. 
If we pray for 30 to 45 minutes and our mind is wandering down the road. Amen. I've used this illustration before. But sometimes I thought I was just going to have to get up, Brother Harold, and go chasing it and grab it and bring it back. While my mind is on this that I'm doing, that that I've got going. Amen. How am I going to get this accomplished? How am I going to get that taken care of? And we spend the time there. But it's not quality time when it's not intimate with God. Amen. Oh, God, repair those altars. Amen. God will send his, his presence. And we'll be rewarded for it. I guarantee you we'll be rewarded for it. I don't mean to worry you with this, especially with something we've heard over and over and over. And I questioned it. But I felt prompted from the Lord to tell him, tell me to tell us tonight if we'll follow Elijah's prescription, we'll see a firefall. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. I'm expecting it. I'm expecting it. But I'm going to tell you, people are not looking for a form of godliness. They can find it anywhere. Amen. They can find it anywhere. Can we stand all over the house? Oh, God. I realize Brother Sean talked about we've got to have a form. We do. But there is a form that just a form of godliness, but there's no power in it. They can find that anywhere. Let's get that power prevalent. Let it be manifested in our life. All the way around us. Come find us a place to pray here tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.